motion um, regarding the status of the building at the time of his visit. I have carefully reviewed the evidence of PW1, who was extensively cross-examined for weeks, and there's nowhere in his evidence in which he claimed he went to New York as part of the investigation. In fact, Mr. Noah was cross-examined extensively for over three weeks. His evidence is recorded at page 17 to page 84 of the Record of Proceedings. He commenced his evidence on the 21st day of January 2022 and finished on the 19th of April 2022. This period, by any stretch of the imagination, was exhaustive of all the points that felt, the defense felt necessary to be elicited from the course examination. His evidence at page 75 of the record of proceedings was as follows. I did not travel to New York. There's nowhere in his evidence where he stated that he had visited New York. His evidence was that he was in China on another investigation and as supervisor, he reviewed the evidence obtained from the team of investigators that went to New York. To New York. It is therefore an error on the part of the deponent to state in an affidavit evidence that, that was never led in this court and which calls into question the credibility of the application. I would therefore reject the application on the basis that the factual basis of the application was made on an incorrect assertion of facts. The evidence of PW 17 and 18. The evidence of those witnesses deal with the status of the building between 2018 and 2020, when the said witnesses were appointed and other issues of facts in relation to the transactions and discussions concerning the building. This court has viewed the building in the state in which it is in 2023. The evidence of those witnesses are already before the court. This court is therefore required to consider the locus report and the view of the building within the context of the evidence already before the court and draw its own conclusions of facts, particularly in relation to the state in which the building was in 2018 to 2020 and what was seen by this court in 2023. These witnesses were extensively cross-examined and there is no arguable basis to recall them for further cross-examination. This court would evaluate the evidence of the locus visit as envisaged by paragraph one of my orders of the 20th day of March 2023, which I would repeat. The purpose of the visit to New York is to conduct a locus in co-visit to the Chancery Building in New York in order to view the said Chancery Building in the light of the evidence given in this court by witnesses and to clear any gray areas or ambiguities attendant to evidence earlier adduced by the parties. Further, there is insufficient basis identified in the affidavit to support an application for a recall. Where the evidence is inconsistent, it is for me as the trial judge to draw my own conclusions on the credibility or otherwise of the evidence before me upon an evaluation of all the evidence in the case. Further exam course examination of PW 17 and 18 will in my judgment and on the affidavit evidence before me add nothing to the evidence already before the court and can only serve to create further confusion and distortion of the evidence. In the circumstances, I'll make the following orders. One, the application to recall PW1, 17, and 18 are hereby refused for the reasons given, and there shall be no orders as to costs. I'll deal with the second ruling. Oh, okay. I'll come back to you, Mr. Kagbo. Um, this ruling concerns an objection raised by Mr. ASCC Esquire for the second and fourth accused with respect to the tendering of the locus in co-visit report by the court registrar, Alpha Said and Kano. I've already overruled the objection as I considered that that objection had no arguable legal merit and disclosed no issues of law. 
Notwithstanding, I did indicate that I would give a written ruling on the issue which I now do. In summary, Mr. Sisse had submitted that the second and fourth accused persons were objecting to the tendering of the Locos in Co report on the basis that the law and procedure in Samuel M. J. Cassell and V. Dumbuya, Fala, and others' civil appeal 2883, dated 29th of March 1989, were not followed. And consequently, the Locos in Co report ought not to be tendered and was a nullity. He further relied upon the order of this court dated the 20th of March 2023, in particular, Order 2 of the said order. Mr. E.K. Amara responded to the objection, which I shall deal with in due course. On the 20th of March 2023, I did give orders with respect to the conduct of the locus. I am informed by the registry that the order was served upon all counsel through the Judiciary Anti-Corruption Division WhatsApp group that is established for that purpose. In that order, I relied upon a number of cases, in particular, the case of Kamara and others v. Cagbo, Civil Appeal 21, 2006, Sayaloon Court of Appeal 26 of January 2010, in which the Court of Appeal had this to say. The usual practice when a trial judge visits a locus in co is to make separate notes or records of the inspection. This is normally done by the registrar of the court who takes notes of what transpires at the locus and when the court resumes, the notes made by the registrar are produced and tendered in evidence by him, and they then form part of the record of proceedings. After the inspection and on resumption of court sittings, the evidence of witnesses who spoke at the locus on anything touching and concerning the subject matter should be taken on oath and those witnesses would be cross-examined by either party. This is to avoid the trial judge being accused of permitting his mind to be charged with matters not properly in evidence. The decisions of EGDK and others and Obira 1995 West Africa Court of Appeal report Muzuik and others, and Inyok and others were relied upon all West African Court of Appeal reports. What is important is that the visit must put to rest matters about which conflicting evidence has been led. The bottom line is that the trial judge, by his visit to the locus, has not done anything that engendered a miscarriage of justice in the matter. What is frowned upon when such a visit takes place is for the judge making himself a witness. And that is part Justice Sonia Bashtaki, Justice of the Supreme Court. At paragraph five of that order, I referred to further comments by Justice S. Bashtaki, in which she stated the following, that the issue for consideration is whether the procedure adopted by the trial judge during and after the visit to the locus in co amounted to a departure from the established procedure and occasioned a miscarriage of justice, and that the purpose of the visit is to avoid a miscarriage of justice. In particular, I give the following orders which I consider to be relevant. One, the purpose of the visit to New York is to conduct a locus in quo visit to the Chancery Building in New York in order to view the said Chancery Building in the light of the evidence given in this court by witnesses and to clear any gray areas or ambiguities attendant to the evidence earlier adduced by the parties. Two, a witness who has testified previously in the trial may attend the locus visit and give evidence at the locus if the prosecution chooses to do so. Any said witness may be recalled for cross-examination when the trial resumes. And after the locus in co visit, the prosecution may reopen their case to deal with matters arising solely from the visit. Four, the defense may be allowed upon an application made to the court to allow the recall of witnesses in relation to matters solely arising from the locus visit. And any witness who testifies at the locus would be required to do so on oath and may be cross examined by either party regarding any matter touching and concerning 
the subject matter of the visit. The purpose of the locus visit and the procedures concerned with the locus were clearly set out in that order and in previous orders that I had made in that regard. Paragraph 564 of Archibald's criminal practice and pleading sets out the practice and procedures for locus in co-visits in criminal proceedings. They are fundamental matters a court must adhere to, which can be summarized as follows. Witnesses who have already testified at the trial may attend and take part in the locus in view. Where such witnesses take part in the view, those witnesses must be called for cross-examination if desired and the accused would not be prejudiced in any way. Witnesses are only allowed to give a demonstration. There's nothing wrong with a simple view without witnesses being present. A locus in co-visit can be done at any time during the trial, as was the case in Ivy Wally 1847. It is necessary to point out that a visit to the locus in co, in this case the Chancery Building, constitutes real evidence where the court inspects such evidence. An unwieldy object such as a building has to be viewed in situ. In Buckingham v. Daily News 1956, three weekly law reports 375, the plaintiff alleged that he had been injured while cleaning the blades of his employer's rotary press on account of their failure to provide him with a reasonably safe system of work. During the course of the trial, the judge in the presence of counsel went to the defendant's premises, inspected the machine, and observed a demonstration by the plaintiff of how he had cleaned the blades. The Court of Appeal accepted that the judge had been entitled to treat what he had seen as a form of real evidence. It is just as much a part of the evidence as if the machine had been brought into the well of the court and the plaintiff had there demonstrated what took place. Similarly, it may be appropriate for the court to visit a particular location on site. This may be a simple view where the court inspects the place, the locus in co where the road accident occurred or the alleged murder was committed, or in fact, inspection may be combined with a demonstration where one or more witnesses explain their vantage point and what they saw or had at the material time. Although it is clear from the authorities that an out-of-court demonstration or the out-of-court inspection of an object which could, in theory, have been seen in the courtroom is regarded as the observation of admissible real evidence, it has been said that a simple view of the locus in co is, strictly speaking, nothing more than an opportunity for the tribunal of fact or the trial judges in this case to understand the context of the case so they can follow the evidence and apply it. The several authorities in that regard, London General Omnibus Company and Lovell, Scott, Newmarket Corporation, etc., etc. It has also been said, however, that a simple view of a building, for example, is real evidence in substitution for or supplemental to plans, photographs, and the like. It should further be noted that there is little, if any, significance in practice between the status of views and demonstrations. In Avi Sawonyuk 2002 Criminal Appeal Report 220, the trial court moved from the United Kingdom in England and paid a visit to the village of Domachevo in Belarus, where the Jewish population were slaughtered by Nazi sympathizers in 1942 and a prosecution eyewitness was permitted to show the jury where he had stood and watch murder being committed. Because the court is effectively relocating when it inspects a site or object or observes a demonstration, the judge and jury, if there is one, should attend together, and the parties or their legal representatives should be present or at least be given the opportunity to be present. With these principles in mind, there are procedures that are required to be followed on a visit to the locus in co in a criminal case. 
have had regard notwithstanding to Mr. Sisse's authority upon which he relied. At paragraph 5 of that authority, which is the Cassell case, the court was clear as to the procedure to be followed. And it's as follows. The court should be accompanied by the parties and any relevant witnesses to the inspection. The parties or the witnesses there point out such places and things which are material to the case. Then when the court reassembles, all the persons who were used at the view must be put into the witness box and on oath state what part they took in the recent visit to the locals and what each did. In similar manner, in Kamara and another v. Kagbo Civil Appeal 21, 2006, which was a decision that I mentioned earlier, the Honorable Justice Bashta Key JSC opined as follows, that the usual practice when a trial judge visits a locus in court is to make separate notes or records of the inspection. This is normally done by the registrar of the court who takes notes of what transpires at the locus. And when the court resumes, the notes made by the registrar are produced and tendered in evidence by him and they then form part of the record of proceedings. Most significantly, Justice Bashtaki held as follows. After the inspection and on resumption of court sittings, an emphasis mine here and, and not before, the evidence of witnesses who spoke, and again, evidence not given on oath, emphasis mine at the locus on anything touching and concerning the subject matter should be taken on oath, and again, emphasis mine at the resumption of the court sitting and not at the locus. And those witnesses would be cross examined by either party. This is to avoid the trial judge, as she put it, being accused of permitting his mind to be charged with matters not properly in evidence. And again, this is simply because witnesses do not testify in the conventional form at the locus, and consequently the evidence might not have been properly obtained from a witness on the oath and course examined. Hence the requirement to subsequently enter the records after the evidence has been given on oath into the record of proceedings. With all due respect to Mr. Sisse, he cannot arguably object to the report being tendered for the sole reason that witnesses did not testify on the oath at the locus visit. Even his own authority that he relies upon makes no such point. There's no requirement either in law or in practice for a witness to testify on oath at a demonstration and the light of such testimony be subjected to cross-examination at the locus only for the witness to return to court and be cross-examined again. The Samuel Cassell case emphasizes that the appropriate time for witnesses to testify is when the court reassembles, and that is the time for persons who took part at the locus in court to testify on oath, stating which part they took in the recent viewing. The Kamara, the Kamara and Kagbo case, again, is another matter in which the Court of Appeal decision also makes essentially the same point. It is rather disingenuous, I have to say, of Mr. Sisse to suggest that any other procedure, save for the two identified procedures from the Court of Appeal decisions, one of which he relied upon, are the applicable procedures to be used in this instance. And in particular, I consider that such a submission would amount to judicial vandalism should the court set out a procedure which requires a witness to be cross-examined twice about the same issues. It is for this reason that in the Kamara and Kagbo case, the court pointed out the critical role the registrar plays in taking notes of what transpired at the locus, and he alone is then required to produce and tender those notes in evidence and the form part of the record of proceedings thereafter. This was a simple view of an item of real evidence, which is the chance rebuilding and which is the subject matter of this case. 
In paragraph one of my orders, I was clear as to the purpose of the visit, which was to conduct a locus in co visit to the Chancery Building in order to view the said building in the light of the evidence given in this court by witnesses and to clear any gray areas or ambiguities attendant to the evidence earlier adduced by the parties. There has been a, no deviation from those orders. The witnesses in the form of Mr. Tijan, who spoke at the hearing, are being recalled to give their evidence on oath as to what transpired at the Locus in Co. and subsequently they'll be subject to cross-examination. Mr. Nalo, who is the first accused in this case, has indicated that he will be testifying on oath and he will also be subject to cross-examination. The response by Mr. E.K. Amara for the state is unarguably at the crux of the matter. The registrar did not testify at the locus, and he could not have done so as this was not his role. His role is clearly set out in the Kamara v. Kagbo case, where he is merely required to take notes and tender those notes when the proceedings um, of the court resume and the court has reassembled. He was lawfully sworn when he attempted to tender the relevant documents and the evidence he tendered. The defense chose, and the prosecution, I have to say, chose not to cross-examine him. He is not a witness in the case. He is the registrar who is merely carrying out an official judicial function to take notes and to produce those notes for the court after the court has reassembled. I have to say there is no merit in Mr. Cissé's objection which was why the objection was overruled and the report tendered as is required by the decisions of the Court of Appeal, one of which he relied upon. With respect to the second ground of objection, this ground is equally unmeritorious. The provisions of Order 2 of my order does not in any way create a prejudice to the second or fourth accused. The use of the words, a witness who has testified previously in the trial may attend the locus visit and give evidence at the locus if the prosecution chooses to do so speaks volumes for itself. Any said witnesses may be recalled for cross examination when the trial resumes and accords with the spirit and intent of both Court of Appeal decisions. Mr. Cissé conveniently forgot to mention order five and six of my orders which gives equal opportunity to the defense upon an application made to court to allow the recall of witnesses in relation to matters solely arising from the locus visit on the one hand and provides secondly that any witness who testifies at the locus would be required to do so on oath subsequently and may be cross-examined by either party regarding any matter touching and concerning the subject matter of the visit. By any stretch of the imagination, Mr. Tijan, assuming but not conceding that he testified or rather spoke at the locus in co, has been recalled and he will come here to testify on oath and be subject to cross-examination. There is therefore no prejudice or injustice to the second and the fourth accused by the invocation of these procedures. This ground of objection, again, has no arguable legal merits and is also overruled. I deal with the issue of costs. Objections such as these objections are the sorts of objections that waste the court's time and adversely affect the administration of justice. Such conduct by solicitors have the effect of causing unnecessary delays to court proceedings and regrettably serves no useful purpose. Whilst the courts do have a duty to actively consider and will encourage and consider meritorious applications of law that promote the administration of justice and in the interest of justice, the courts would not encourage or should not encourage unmeritorious applications or applications that tend to defeat the ends of justice. Where those circumstances occur, the court may make a special order for costs against the party who has wasted the court's time and resources. 
This means that they would have to compensate the cost for costs that have been incurred unnecessarily. The lawyer may also be personally liable for costs if they have acted unreasonably, improperly, or negligently. Lawyers ought not to nitpick arguments that tie up courts and add to clients' bills. The courts have long had jurisdiction to penalize lawyers for wasting the court's time. In Mylard and Weldon 1596, the court not only made a wasted cost order against a lawyer whose pleadings were too long, but ordered that he be paraded around the courts barefoot with the pleadings hung around his neck. In P and O and SO, the Minister for Justice and Equality and Others, 2015, Lafway J imposed wasted costs for making an application which was as ultimately subsequently considered bereft of any legal basis and was worsened by the application not being withdrawn immediately after the other side's submissions were delivered, thereby failing to obviate wasteful use of the time and energy of the court. Henceforth, counsel and solicitors who make or pursue unmeritorious and unarguable legal applications to court that are plainly doomed to fail from the outset should expect to be penalized in wasted cost orders against them personally. In the Fletamos case, the Court of Appeal considered the wasted court's jurisdiction further and was satisfied that a hopeless case was being litigated on the advice of the lawyers involved. They had no hesitation in affirming a wasted court's order where it was to be regarded as a solicitor-led litigation. The wasted cost jurisdiction is to be exercised summarily with due regard to fairness to both parties, but without full trial. There's authority for that in Center High Limited and Care, Amen and others, 2013. Having said that, the court recognizes that it is the duty of the advocate to present his client's case even though he may think that it is hopeless and even though he may have advised his client that it is. So it is not enough that the court considers that the advocate has been arguing a hopeless case. The litigant is entitled to be heard, as in this case, the accused are entitled to be heard on procedural applications and to penalize the advocate for presenting his client's case to the court would be contrary to the constitutional principles of law. The position is different, however, if the court concludes that there has been improper time wasting by the advocate or the advocate has knowingly lent himself to an abuse of the process. However, it is relevant to bear in mind that if a party is raising issues or is taking steps which have no reasonable prospect of success or a scandalous or an abuse of process, both the aggrieved party and the courts have powers in instances to remedy this situation otherwise. The making of a cost, wasted cost order should not be the primary remedy. By definition, it only arises once the damage has been done, and it is the last result. Order 57, Rule 9, Sub Rule 1 of the High Court Rules, provides that where in any proceedings costs are incurred improperly or without reasonable cause or are wasted by undue delay or by any other misconduct or default, the court may make against any solicitor whom it considers to be responsible, whether personally or through a servant or agent, an order disallowing the cost as between the solicitor and his client and directing the solicitor to repay the client's cost which the client has been ordered to pay to the other party in the proceedings, or direct the solicitor personally to indemnify the other party against cost payable to that party. Counsel should understand that in addition to the statutory wasted cost jurisdiction, the court also has an inherent jurisdiction under the common law over barristers and the solicitors of the high court as its officers to require them summarily to compensate a person who suffers loss as a result of improper, unreasonable, or negligent conduct on their part. In the light of the above, 
Mr. ASC say of cancel will be required pursuant to order 57 rule 9 sub rule 2 to show cause why the order should not be made as he had previously been warned of the risk of a wasted cost order being made against him. That's the ruling of the court. Mr. Sissi, you have your checkbook? <laughs> Millen. Get it out. Address you on the, in respect of the first application. Millen, first of all, I want to state that we note your elegant but very forceful language. Yeah. In the, That's the way it should be done. In the rulings. And um, we bow to that and indicate to the court that we'll consider our options. That's fine. Much obliged, sir. Okay. Yes, Mr. C. We've had your ruling with regards to the objections raised. And uh, we intend to make an application to you, again, on the basis of this ruling. My Lord, pursuant to section 68 of the Court Act, number 31 of 1965. Okay. My Lord, my Lord. Milad, on the issue of cost, let me just, because you, 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 you question me, you question me on the I've issue of heard. cost. Milad, you question me on the issue of cost. Milad. No, we, finish, finish what it is, no, no, we'll deal with no, it. Milad, Milad, we have always raised questions and made objections on the basis of the law. And Milad, yes, it is part of the ICOT rules, but the effect of such cost is to gag solicitors. No, no. I mean, Milo, that's, my, that's my position. No, no, no. No, no, I, I, will, I, will, no, no, no. I will not accept that because I recognize very clearly that the court would encourage meritorious applications. Very clear. And in fact, the court actively encouraged that. What the court disagreed is on meritorious applications. My Lord, my Lord. So no. My Lord, I have, Don't go there. My Lord, you have ruled. And you are saying to me to answer your cost. My Lord, that is what I'm doing. Yeah, why the order should not be made. That's what I should be listening is, to. So that is the reason, <laughs> my Lord. My Lord, ah. my Lord, we have contributed to the jurisprudence of this nation. Fine. Mm -hmm. Not just in this matter, but in other cases. And my Lord, specifically in anti-corruption cases. My Lord, I will boldly state that in this jurisdiction, the leading anti-corruption cases have been handled by this very African OCC. And my Lord, the reasons for the objections A one, to enhance fair hearing. Two, it's for the liberty of the accused persons. My Lord, you have ruled on the position. We have accepted that position. But my Lord, put in cost. Financial does, detriment. Does order 57 not allow the court to do that? <laughs> My Lord, my Lord, I am saying, you have, I have already conceded to order 57, my Lord. My Lord, you know the kind of practitioner that I am. I have conceded to it. Well, Lord, charge accept, yourself. My Lord, my Lord, I don't want to charge myself. You don't want to charge yourself? My Lord, I, don't want, I just want it to go to what we've done. So, do you prefer that I charge you? No, my Lord, my Lord, I just want you to look at what we have done previously in this jurisdiction when it comes to SEC matters. And 
Mm -hmm. Yes, my lord. My lord, if you look... Well, listen, let Jones don't be talking to me because he'll have to help colleague. you pay. My lord is my colleague. <laughs> uh, if he's willing to help you pay, that's fine. My lord is my colleague. <laughs> <laughs> and we are in the same team. And my lord, my lord, the industry we have taken to do the research. My lord, we say it's, it's not frivolous. The industry we've taken, the authorities we've brought up, and uh, my lord, this is what the public wants to see. At every length of the way. And the law allows for these applications. Where I knock you down is your own authority that you relied upon <laughs> makes the same Milord. point that I relied upon in my Mil others. Milord, you have stated yeah. that position. That is where I have a problem with you. Milord, you've stated that position. You know. <laughs> you've stated that position. My Lord, you are the arbiter. You've given your own interpretation. So I will... In accordance with yours Milord, too. My Lord, my Lord, I will not question what you said. No, but you relied upon your authority. Yes, my Lord, I have my yeah. own interpretation. So I agree with your authority. <laughs> no, 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 not the interpretation, <laughs> but I gave to it. But it's what you relied upon. I followed yes. it. So, my Lord, I am asking <laughs> that you consider the factors I have raised in reaching at your decision whether to impose cost on solicitor who has represented his clients <laughs> on the basis of fair hearing and for the liberty of the accused persons. My Lord, justice. requires that applications are made throughout the proceedings. Yeah, and we say yes. We encourage them. We want to hear them. We're we'll happy with them. But meritorious we'll ones. Ones that have legal Milord, arguments. Milord you've, Milord, you've ruled. I'll go by Well, it. charge yourself. Milord, Milord, because I, you cost Milord, me sleep last night. Mi so Milord, charge yourself. Milord, I cannot, Milord, I cannot charge myself. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. Mr. Kagbo will help you pay. You know. Milord is retired. <laughs> nah, but not tired. <laughs> <laughs> and solicitor and then we implore your lordship to look kindly upon this being the first time that your lordship has been inclined to rule and contemplating awarding cost personally against the solicitor. That is uniquely unusual and inappropriate in this circumstance. Un Milord. Unusual, Mr. Kagbo? Milord, yes. When the rules make provision for it? They do, my lord. But because you have a court last doesn't mean you can always chop. No, lord. but you will chop when you need to chop. Um, certainly, my lord, mm -hmm. but um, not in this instance. I implore your lordship. <laughs> I expected you to make a spirited defense for your head of chambers. Well, <laughs> my lord, he's doing the job the best he can. And um, certainly, this application should be coming your way, my lord. No, I, I don't, and that's why I told you that if I have to sit up all night to do it, I'll do it. Because we're happy to contribute to the jurisprudence of the country. No problem with that. As my lord pleases. But I relied upon his own authority, and I warned him yesterday that he's likely to face costs, and he did not listen. My lord, you see, <laughs> perhaps there was a slight underestimation of your research progress. He knows. We've been in this and, for a long um, time. Yes. He knows. So, we'd rather continue yeah. along that path, my lord. <laughs> Thank you very much. Mr. Sisse and I have been together for a long time. He, he knows how we do it. So it should not be taken by surprise. Thank you for your kind consideration, <laughs> Milord. Right. Thank you. Mr. Amara, what do you say? Sorry? Milord, sorry I'm having problems with my but I think it's working now. Milord, um, Council has shown no reason. Which one? I mean, um, uh, African 
So we see say. Because he spoke and his boss spoke too. No, uh, well, the head of chambers, <laughs> the current head of chambers, African, Mr. Sisi, I mean, he showed no reason why costs must not be awarded against him. My lord, the, the, three, the, three, the three issues he raised, one, liberty of accused persons and fair hearing. My lord, it is even for the liberty, if you have serious consideration of the liberty of the accused person as defense counsel and fair hearing, you must not just take authorities and read them truncatedly and bring them, rush them to court, believing that they could be read truncatedly by the other side. My Lord, that one is no reason why counsel should not, well, why courts should not be awarded against counsel. My Lord, he also invited the court to look at matters he had done, ACC matters he had done previously. Those matters he, had done, he has done would have no merit and no business to do in this instant proceedings. My Lord, that one also is not a reason I submit. And he talks of industry of research and authorities that he brought up. My Lord, if you are sitting for an examination, it, it matters not how many booklets you fill. If you are not writing sense, you'll fail. And as, solicitor, we have resp as solicitors, we have responsibility not only to research, but to ensure that our research are relevant to what we want to present them for. I'll repeat, as I said at the outset, that when authorities are read, especially by lawyers, they should be read and understood in their entirety and not be truncatedly read. You know, those were the points raised for consideration when counsel was invited to show reason why costs should not be awarded against him. And my Lord, I submit that those points are pointless. And my Lord, in the interest of ensuring that justice is really served, and this court's, this court's time is not wasted further anymore, this court's time is not wasted further anymore. It's emphasis. It's not, it's not tautology. Mr. Mr. Mac no, no commissioner would expect. <laughs> I'll come to you. So, um, as, a, as, a, as, a matter of, as a matter of fact, my lord, no cause has been shown. And should this be entertained, my lord, I'm afraid, the strategy to waste the court's time will continue. Such is my submission, my lord. Please you, my lord. I mean, I believe that is, I want to state here, my lord, that it is rather unfortunate that Mr. Amara, hold on, hold on. Hmm? Well, these are the kind of things that waste the court's time. But he has a right to address the court. You see, I mean, this is the problem. No, look, look, this is the problem. When you make your submissions, they kept quiet. When they make their submissions, you go all hoo ha, you don't want to hear them. No, 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 that's not the point. You make submission with you know, candor and respect. No, but you listen, don't make submission listen, with respect hey, hey, and language that tend to hey, disrespect hey, the other side, my lord. With all respect, no, my no, lord. no, please. There's a decorum in the court. If there is an issue about what he said, Mr. Sisi was going to respond, he could bring it to the attention of the bench. But you shouting across the bar, I mean, how does that solve the problems? Yeah. Well, my, my lord is still not address the issue. You know, he's upset with him. You are also shouting at him. He's shouting at him. Yeah, and you're upset with him too. But if you have a problem, put it to the bench that what he said was inappropriate. You know, and these are the things that waste the court's time. Because we have to stand down now and wait for you to finish your banter. My Lord, we have no intention of wasting the Ma. court's time. And Not is, you, Mr. No, it's rather unfortunate no. that uh, Mr. Amara is suggesting that our tactics...
turn no. to waste Mr. the Kagbo, my lord. Mr. Kagbo, we all know these are adversarial proceedings. Yes, my lord. Council will always try to score points against the other side. You are doing it as defense council. They are doing it as prosecutors. It's the spirit of the game. The Lord will do it in a very respectful Fine. manner. I don't have a problem with that. But Never. if there's an issue, that's why the bench is here. Even, we object to what that man Mr. is saying. Maxibo, even know. when Mr. Matsibo um, drags pointless points, we are never dis uh, respectful to him. No, no but, but at the same time, you, your colleagues are on the other side. Whenever Mr. Matsibo gets up, uh, I mean, come on. Allow the man to speak. He has a right of audience. He has a right to speak, my ah. But yeah. such inelegant... But and if he says language, language that is intemperate, I'll stop him. I can understand taking yeah. castigation from the bench. No, no, but no. not from my colleague on the uh, other side, my Mr. Kagbo... It shouldn't happen. Mr. Kagbo, the point is, if comments are made that are not proper comments, yes, the Lord. proper thing to do, like you always do, is to refer it to the bench. As me Lord, but what I have a problem with is when colleagues are on that side shouting across the bar at the opposing council, and if they start shouting too, we're going to go into chaos. In Parliament, my Lord, that is called undertones. Well, this is where this is not Parliament. Yes, my Lord. You know, Parliament deals with that, what they deal with. We deal with, things, with stuff here. My Lord, you know, come on. I, I table my learned friend's comments for your attention, my Lord. No, no, I bear in mind what he says, but you know the legal partners rules of conduct are very clear you push your case forcefully his submissions are forceful likewise mr cc pushed his case forcefully yesterday but politely my lord yes albeit well politely is a relative term but the all mark of an advocate is to push your case forcefully which i don't As have an issue is, with we leave it in your but it's the shouting lord. across the bar that is the problem because Nylander is a bass is a bass singer, and when he speaks like that, the whole court, oh, you know, just shakes all over the place. He's an acquire, my lord. Yeah, he used to be. Oh, you know, and when he speaks bass, you hear it goes all through the mic. What's your like? You know, looking at the time, it's almost going to one o'clock, my lord. And, yeah. Um, yeah. Let's go to Kaila. Hmm? Yes. Mr. Sisi. Yeah, my lord. My lord. My senior has raised the the bad comments or distasteful comments made by my colleague against this team. My Lord, you have previously advised council to be careful what they say. And now we are live on television and uh, a colleague is not even addressing you as I'm doing, he was addressing directly the defense team. My Lord, that is downright disrespect to colleagues, because we all respect to each other. <laughs> and my Lord, he started this system yesterday. When he came. He started this system yesterday, my Lord. I am highlighting this point once more. And a lot for him to again talk about a strategy to delay. My Lord, we are going to re-emphasize our position that the prosecution took 26 months to investigate and prosecute this case. Of which you were responsible as well. My Lord, my Lord I am saying the prosecution no, took of 26 which, no, months equality of arms. to investigate. No, please. No, Mr. Sissé. Equality of arms, you were part of that too. My lord, my lord, ah, I will say the prosecution took because that's the case for the prosecution. And my lord brought in 18 witnesses and is now saying we have a strategy. We have a strategy to delay the proceedings. But my lord, that, that is his view. My lord, no. my lord, that cannot be his view. No, but, my lord, but, 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 the but view no, of no, the no 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 Mr. Mr. C C C no matter what strategy anybody has, I've highlighted it in this ruling just now, that the trial judge is in control of the trial. If I feel that they want to delay, I know what to do. If I feel you want to delay, I know what to do. So what he says is his view. He's an advocate. He has a right of audience in the court. If he steps out of line, 
I'll rein him in. No issues with that. No, my lord, my lord, my lord, my lord it you affects know. the reputation of, uh, of council as well as the accused persons. If council is stating that we have a strategy to delay, and he's saying it on live broadcast, my lord. No, that my, is... My lord, it is. No. It has the reputation. No. It those, has the effect of damaging no, the reputation of council. Those are his legal submissions. My lord, my lord, those okay. cannot be legal submissions, my lord. No, well... They cannot be. Well, you might not like... You see, look. Let me tell you something, Mr. C.C. When I was prosecuting... Your colleague there, Nicole Wilson, used to have the same shout at me. And I used to tell him that you might not like to hear it, but you have to hear it. You know, that's how we do it. It's the name of the game. We argue. Lord, but we don't take Lord, arguments personally. Lord, I do agree we argue. You know, but my Lord, the argument ought to be respectful. Really? Respectful, yes, my Lord. <laughs> we, my Lord Courtious, we, I should say. My not Lord, respectful. My Lord, I... My Lord, I bow to your wisdom, consciously. Yeah, Most grateful, my Lord. But my Lord, it has to be maintained because this is a noble profession. So what do you want him to do? You want him to come and cut? My Lord, to, for him to publicly withdraw that <laughs> statement. Most grateful, my Lord. I mean, come on. I mean, <laughs> all right, you know what? Let us, let us, leave, the, let us leave the FITI aspect out of it. Do you have your checkbook? Let's talk about that. This is Easter. We learn, we learn this kind of Easter, we, we don't even see the Easter coming. So, <laughs> it's, it's, my lord, it's almost one o'clock, and our learned friends over there are wasting time, my lord. <laughs> Traveling when? No. Sorry, You're the mic, I can't hear you. Uh, the indication he has made is that it's on Monday, and uh, he had intended to uh, approach your lordship over that. Particular to travel on Monday? Oh, yes. And to return when? Um, 18. 14. All right. Yes. Is it out of the jurisdiction? Apparently, yes. 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 Let him cancel it. No, no. I, I need to get more information because I'm not getting with your information. Leave, my Lord, yeah. Uh, let Let me hear from him. Yes. Mr. Bogart. Is Only that he's not traveling as an expert. <laughs> M right. Mr. Bokari, what's all this traveling issue? Yeah, Let you can uh, stay. Stay there. Yes, my lord, I'll be accompanying the minister to uh, Abuja um, to assess the progress made in the construction of the new ECOWAS building. <laughs> okay. Mr. Bokari, did you see this coming? Did you not see this coming? <laughs> yes, sir. it's part of my duty, so <laughs> I advise the minister in terms of infrastructure. All right. Um, when are you back? I'll be hopeful. On the 14th, I'll be in the office. 14th. I will report for work. Sir. All right. Okay. All right. Um, on a very serious note, I think um, sometimes it's good to just calm the atmosphere down. But on a very serious note, I think lawyers need to be minded that there's no need to nitpick every point of law. You know, and in a matter such like this, the applications made by Mr. Kagbo 
was simply an application that borders on section 23. Those are arguments. You would have noted that I did not impose any cost on Mr. Kagbo because it's um, an application, albeit refused, but a meritorious one. It's a legal one that has a legal basis. But where the court should have a problem is when counsel submits an authority which is on all fours with earlier authorities that the court has relied upon and gives a different interpretation to that authority when the meaning of that authority is plain. It is obvious that the only requirement that had to be considered insofar as low-cost visits are concerned is the interest of justice. There ought not to be any prejudice to accused persons as a result of what has happened at the locus. And it was obvious that those persons that spoke at the locus have been recalled. And there's an opportunity given to the defense to cross-examine them. So there's no prejudice because the defense has an ample opportunity to ask questions based on what has gone on at the locus. So in those circumstances, you need to wonder what was the purpose of the objection taken by Mr. Sisse. And this is why I decided that I was going to give a full written ruling on it to guide other councils that, you know, we would not entertain this kind of applications. Because the arguments that came from him and Mr. Kagbo was in relation to Section 23. Section 23 has several ambits. One of those important ambits that are missed several times by counsel is the right to a fair trial within a reasonable time. And every time the court has to sit back and give rulings on applications like this, it wastes time. Because you know that eventually, looking at the overall situation, that this application will not succeed. So if you make it, it means the court has to slow down, go back and rule on the issue and then come back, which is time wasting. So this is where I have an issue with what Mr. Cissé has done. But um, knowing Mr. Cissé as well as I do, I would have had no hesitation to impose the severest of penalties on him if I thought for one minute that he was acting in bad faith. You know, that is his style. He does not act in bad faith. He is the kind of man that does things forcefully, you know, and he, and he overkills. That is his style. So I know that. But if it was some other counsel, I would have imposed costs. Punitive costs. Because, you see, you don't make applications in bad faith. You know, you look at the surrounding circumstances and then decide, well, is it worth my while making this application? Because, you see, you forget that some of these accused persons are on half salary. This trial needs to finish quickly. You know, they, I mean, they, they cannot be subjected to delays because counsel wants to make certain applications to court that have no merits. You know, they need to have this matter out of the way so if they're going to be acquitted, they go back to work. You know, and it's a welfare issue. So, please, you know, on this occasion, in this trial, let me be clear. On this occasion, I will not impose costs, you know, but on a serious note, I went to the extent of writing a ruling on it so council understands the basis upon which we operate. But honestly speaking, I'm going to promise you, and when I make promises, you know I keep them. If any further applications that are unmeritorious of this kind of nature are filed in this court, honestly, when I've given an indication, you continue to pursue it, I will impose costs. Now, I will, you know, an application that is doomed to fail is obvious from the start. Very obvious. You know, there are applications that are borderline, there are applications that lawfully, of course, I want to hear them. I don't care whether it's 100 applications made, I will hear them. But just know that if you make an application that has no legal merit, when I've told you it has no legal merit, and you pursue it, and I rule against you, I'll award costs. So just so we, so we are clear on that, you know, counsel should sit and look properly at the applications before they make them. Let there be arguable legal points to the issues you want to raise, and of course, I'll be glad to sit up all night to write them. But if I have people making applications that have no merit, you know, 
it's a waste of the court's time, it's a waste of the other accused person's time, then of course I will impose costs next time round. So just so that we are clear. And um, talking of people on half salary, the fourth accuses or no salary at all. Precisely. So that's the reason why it needs to have this matter out of the way. Then people can think something else. Precisely. Mira, and that also, is what we are working towards. Yes. And also, yes, I myself, my mm -hmm. workload have gone backwards because of this case. Yes, my lord. So again, and my lifestyle as well has gone backwards. Ah. Yes. Completely backward because I've lost my holidays last year. I couldn't go on holidays. I'm probably going to lose more holidays again this year. And, and, uh, come on. And besides, the court Milo. needs this court. Hold on. The court needs this court yes. for the Supreme Court. There are several matters lined up for the Supreme Court. Beloved, we empathize with you. So you see. So uh, if we're going to argue legally, let's argue legally. No yes, problems. Yeah. One last request, my lord. Mm -hmm. um, would want copies of the rulings. Sure. When we rise, you, you get it. The lady, um, the registrars will give them to you. As my lord pleases. Uh, it's been done, so no Thank problem. You, right. Mr. Sise, you had an application you were making. I think you said section 68. My lord, for now, we'll just leave it as it is. <laughs> well, now, I, know, I know the application he wants to make, but before you make it, go read the state versus Francis Gabidon. I know what he wants to do, but go go and read that authority. Then you can come back. All right? We've been in this game for long, so you, you know that. <laughs> so go read that authority and then come back. And then I will hear your application. But then if I rule against you, you know what will happen, don't you? <laughs> All right? Well, it's up to you. You know, it's been, it's been pretty clear. Right. Mr. Kagbo. Just to notify you, my lord, that I've extended an, uh, an invitation to my learned friend, Man Sibo, to spend the Easter with me of country. <laughs> is, is he only Mr. Man Sibo? He can yeah. come accompanied, of course. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Man Sibo, do you understand the meaning of the word Mau? Maro. Mau. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> I've been advised. It relates again on That's one right. on one person and possibly your mind is why well. I don't. So you need to think carefully before accepting that invitation. Right. Um, okay, gentlemen, thank you very much. Um, in view of the, Mr. Bokhari's um, imminent travel, we cannot obviously make progress at this time, so we'll adjourn to the 17th of April. April the 17th, that's a Monday at 10 a.m. Right. But we wish you a very happy Easter. Yes, indeed. And I was going to say the same. I wish you all a happy Easter. Um, and for those who are Muslims, the obvious Muslims, I don't know about the ones that are Muslims elsewhere. Please call it. No, no, I would not want to be impugned. But the, the ones that are not obvious Muslims, we know them. <laughs> well, Lord, the, the beauty is uh, for the coming Ramadan, my learned friend, Mr. Giva, who was a devout Christian, I mean, has converted to Islam, I mean, yes. upon marrying an Islamic wife, I mean. Yeah. So thank the Honorable is now a Muslim. Yes, I saw that, and in fact, I was going to, I was going to, to interrogate him further on that, just to make sure. My Lord, I'll meet you in chamber. <laughs> <laughs> A happy Easter, my Lord, from the prosecution and the commission. A happy Easter to all of you, and I hope you enjoy your Easter, and we'll all see you back here on the 17th. And Mr. Koma, please make sure Mr. Nico Wilson is not alone over the Easter period.